if your project works up to this point, we've got this welcome screen, login screen, sign up screen. We'll first make the sign up screen work so that there's a user. Once there's a user, it will take us then to the login screen. We sign in with the email and the password, we click go, and that'll take us to PG Home. So PG Home is waiting for us, but there's no way to get to it without the processing in JavaScript. So I'm going to save this file and we want to now jump over to our JavaScript file. This JavaScript file is where we're going to spend a lot of time on. Um, this first line of comment, you don't really need it. That was just there as a placeholder to remind you that in your MyJS file, JavaScript will go here. So I'm just going to clean that out. I don't really need anything there. And we're going to set up an immediately invoked function expression like we worked with JavaScript before, which is the way that uh, lets us create more efficient JavaScript code, code that gets processed faster, uh, helps uh, with silent errors and all of that. So remember the syntax here is opening and close parentheses, open and close parentheses, semicolon, and then we've got the um, inside the first parenthetical pair function open close parentheses again and open close curly brace so when you look at it all like that you might get jumbled up on the parentheses and all of that but that's why I wrote it manually or longhand where I had the first pair of parentheses see how they're highlighted in red then I had the second pair and then semicolon then in the, par the pair of parentheses, anonymous function, open close parentheses, open close curly brace, which then will break that into multiple lines. Quotes use strict, semicolon, end of line. And just to make sure that at the very least, this JS file is linked with our index file, I'm ready to go. Some quick console message that if we run our index file we will see if we run the JavaScript file this is a common mistake here if we run the JavaScript file the web browser will show you JavaScript code you want to go back to the index and run the index file or refresh the index and then open up the developers console F12 and if you see the ready to go message that confirms that your index file HTML is linked to your JS file. If you don't see that or get an error, let's fix that before we go further. So again, if I try to run from the JS file, the web browser will say, great, here's your JavaScript. You want to run it from your index. Typo. Function. Function. Function, sorry. There we go. I, I did that on purpose so that I can see it in the uh, developer's console. <laughs> so when I had the error a moment ago, I would get the pop-up in the console, syntax error, missing parentheses. But now with the correct code, ready to go. So if you see ready to go, we are ready to go. If you don't, double check your spelling. Make sure all of those parentheses and all of that are in the right place. Press F12 in the browser to see this message, of course. Console doesn't appear in the main visible area. And if you see the ready to go message, we're ready. When we worked on JavaScript the first time, we had to create objects in JavaScript that represent elements in HTML. We'll continue to do that. But now we've also got jQuery. So I'll show you both ways, and then we'll focus on the jQuery way. So I'm going to create a variable, an object representing that input form. L form sign up. equal to document dot get element 
by ID which element the form sign up. So we've seen that before. This is the uh, plain old JavaScript way to create an object based on an HTML node. We've seen that before. Now we can use that shorthand or that object in JavaScript to do stuff. Check if the person clicked join and check what they typed in the boxes. So I created this object in JavaScript based on the element with an ID. This is why IDs are so important. An element based on the ID form sign up. No pound symbol right there. Because we're saying get element by ID. And basically the pound symbol is the shortcut, is the keyword of ID. So no pound sign there. Because then I guess we're saying get element by ID ID. So no pound sign. That would be the plain old JavaScript way. I'm going to comment that out. That'll just be a note for you. We're going to use the more modern jQuery mobile way. Write less, do more. It's another var. To differentiate <coughs> that this object that we're creating is now going to be based on jQuery, we use a dollar symbol. If you've ever looked at anyone else's code and you see dollar symbols in JavaScript, it often means jQuery. Same thing, l form sign up equal to something. So one thing that's going to be different, i also make a space up here for a comment in a moment, but what's, um, what's going to be first different is, this is actually optional, but it's very common to put the dollar symbol here to say we're about to use jQuery to do the same thing we did a moment ago, and that is going to be this, the end. Up here we have document that the element by ID. Here we have dollar symbol. And all of that basically means document dot get element by ID. Actually, it just means basically document get element. Notice I have a pound sign here. In this case, it is very important to put the pound sign because the dollar symbol by itself doesn't really mean document dot get element by ID. It means document dot get element. And then I have to specify, is it an ID element, a form element, a class element, a list item element? I think it's more important for them to uh, query selector. Query selector would be better, more technically, the particular type of um, query we're going for, yes. So we have to then be specific to say, well, the thing that has an ID of form sign up, the element that has that form, uh, that ID, in the form. So this is a jQuery way to select, uh, to create an object. The initial dollar is optional. Write less, do more. Notice that it's like half of what the other one is. Um, writing less will also help you avoid errors, but you need to know what, what you're doing. This is a selecting a particular node with the dollar, the jQuery dollar selector. Okay, so I have the one on top commented out because I don't want two of the same thing. But just for your notes, if you wanted to do it in plain old JavaScript, that's the syntax. And if you wanted to do it, uh, if you've got the jQuery library activated, this only works when you have the line right here, script source jQuery. When you've got a connection to a jQuery library, whatever version it is, when you've got that connection in the HTML, then this works. Without it, you'll get error messages in the console. 
it'll say, I don't know what dollar symbol means. Because that's like a key, that's like a shortcut keyword in jQuery. Uh, very similar to what we did previously when we created a, uh, an input form before, uh, we then had to have an event, an event listener. We had to set up a way for it to uh, wait for the button to be submitted to do something. So the old way, we'll, again, we'll do it the uh, plain old JavaScript way, plain, Java, plain JS, just for both ways. We then had uh, L form sign up dot add event listener on the event of a click. Comma. We had a function like function sign up. Plain JS event listener. That'll be a comment because just for completeness. This hasn't come up yet, but if it's happened to you, have you accidentally? Uh, somehow gotten your cursor to look different like that. See how mine's underlined? The normal way is that the cursor looks like that. If you ever find yourself that your cursor looks different, and when you start typing, it starts to type on top of what's there, well, you've changed your mode, your insertion mode. That happens when you press the insert key. On the keyboard, you have a, that home, home and end keys, and next to it, you have insert. When you're on the normal mode, and in the insert mode, but it pushes away characters that are already there. If you accidentally switched over to insert mode, insert key, you're in overtype mode. You're going to type over what's already there. The cursor looks different. So if suddenly you're typing on top of your own code, hit that insert key. Okay, that's the plain old JavaScript way. The, um, well, yeah. We haven't created it yet. This is a unique this is a uniquely created function that will do all the processing. Actually more accurately would have been submit. Click submit. This is a little more accurate what we were trying to do. We have a form that when we submit, we will run a function, sign up, which will capture the name, check if they exist, blah blah blah. This is the plain old JavaScript way. We will do it because we're dealing with a with a jQuery object. We have to do it in a different kind of syntax. And yes, if you create an object via plain old JavaScript, you then need to use plain old JavaScript methods on it. If you create an object in jQuery, you then have to use jQuery methods on it. You cannot mix the two. I'm showing both of them to see the difference. Then you have to use the one that corresponds. So the difference here would be dollar l form sign up because now we need to use the jQuery object and that's our shortcut to mark that this is a jQuery based object dot submit instead of add event listener which event submit we have the event submit the method that is submit. And then here we would have fn sign up like before. Again, that's about like half of the code from the first one. It's not fully complete. I'm just showing you these would be the two ways. jQuery way to um, use an event listener and then run a function. Finish a query event listener uh, to wait for a submit, then run a function. A while ago, on day one, when we had our very first introduction to JavaScript, we had add event listener quotes click. 
and we made a very simple way that you click it and it popped up hello world. Then when we looked at JavaScript the second time and we created a, an actual input form and all of that, we had uh, add event listener quotes submit to run a function. But remember when we had to deal with the default event of a form? That last time I had said, well, a form oftentimes is on a server, it has a certain behavior, it refreshes the screen, all of that. We need to deal with that again here. We're, again, we're not on a server, we don't want to refresh the screen, we want to capture the info, and based on what we're trying to do, then do something else, not an automatic uh, default behavior. So if you recall, we actually not only simply ran that function, back on these notes here, uh, we had to do this anonymous function setup. Actually, that's what that was last time. I wanted to write it shorthand just to kind of jog your memory, hopefully. But this is what we did that other time. We had an event listener waiting for a submit. We had to pass in the default event, which was the refresh, so to speak. We have to capture that event, pass it into the function, which we'll define in a moment, and then event dot prevent default. We stopped the default behavior. We need to do something very similar in the way of jQuery mobile. This one we don't really have exactly a short way to do it. We need the same thing. Event, uh, function, event, wrap that around your function, pass in the event. So at least we, we don't need the add event listener submit. We just have submit method. But this still needs function, curly braces. Those curly braces are around your function so that then we can have the way to pass in the event which comes from the anonymous function callback. So for more notes here to remind you after submit, capture the default event. Let's just call it a refresh. Pass it into the named function. We will create it in a moment. Named function fn sign up to prevent default. behavior. The refresh. So the big idea, we've seen this before, the big idea, new, the new big idea here is we've got a method.submit. This does not exist in plain old JavaScript. If you try to do this on an object, on the object, the version of the object you created up there without the dollar symbol, it'll give you an error, and vice versa. So you create an object, either plain JavaScript or jQuery uh, methods uh, or process, and then you use uh, methods that are either plain JavaScript or jQuery. You can't mix them. We're going to see that there's a, a lot of these built-in methods in, in jQuery that are really nice, like we have a way to fade in and fade out things. Plain old JavaScript is really complex with that. We have a way simply fade in for two seconds, and it does it, instead of writing complex code. Just like we did before, okay, well, we are trying to set up, we, we are trying to do a variety of things. Last time we had a very simple, I don't even remember what we called it, FN Hello World or something, and all it did was it popped up the message, Hello World. But here, this function that we're going to create will be a, a series of many steps to capture the data, process it, etc. And like we did last time, the sequence of this is we've got the object first, the object created first up here. Then we've got the function definition next. Then we've got the event handlers at the end. So I kind of like to write it this way first conceptually, but then 
the actual function definition in order does matter. Sign up. And, and fn sign up. And that's my note to myself as these functions get longer and longer so that I don't lose track of that curly brace. This is where the end of that function is. So the first thing I want to do inside of this function, event.prevent default. Stop the refresh of the screen. The refresh of the screen. Remember earlier when we were testing this, you typed something into the, those boxes of creating an account, and then it refreshed it back to the PG welcome. I don't, I don't want that. So that's, that's what they should do. It should prevent it going back to the, to the beginning. And to check that this is on the right track, we can do console log here. Equate fn sign up. Save it and run it. Open your console. Type valid input into the into the sign up fields and check that you get this feedback in the console. So if I refresh that, gotta check that I spelled it. There we go, lowercase u. No one pointed it out. Thank you. So um, that's fine. It was good to see my mistake. Okay, so line 21. I've got a problem in line 21. Line 21. Sign up. I missed a capital U. You know, if you double click it to select it, it does highlight in other parts of the code and it looks like, well, that's right. Here's one bug in Notepad. It should not select it. It should not highlight it. If I highlight it right here, it does highlight it that I created it. And I think, well, what's the problem? It highlights it. It found it. If I had misspelled it like signups, obviously that won't select anywhere else. But the bug is it should not be highlighting the example when it's misspelled, case-wise. Capital U there, lowercase u there. So if you also followed me exactly diligently with a lowercase, you got that error. That should have been an uppercase because that's what I created up on line 9 or whatever. So that's what that error was saying. Yes? So let's say sign up is in a singer under a function versus in line 14. Line 14? Yeah. It's a comment. Okay. Sing up Z four yeah. whatever. That works as well. You know, any sort of uh, thing in a comment doesn't matter. So um, non-comment stuff matters the most. Let me double check my code. Um, in in Firefox, if you know you get your output down on the bottom here. If you want it on the right, you can click on that. I like it more on the right. Uh, I think it's a little cluttered down at the bottom. So if you move your panel in Firefox to the right, it looks like that. But anyway, when you refresh it, I get the ready to go. Like I saw before on my JS file, line four. I go to sign up. If I try to click join, I get the feedback that this is all required. I've got to fill in something real. As long as it looks like an email address. Password doesn't have to be the same yet. That password is obviously different than that password. But then if I click join, 
the screen did not refresh. That's the big idea. I didn't want it to automatically go back to the home screen. That's the prevent default. And the code then here on line 13 says, okay, we did the console output that the code so far works. If it didn't clear itself, that's fine. We'll deal with that. If it didn't refresh itself back to the home screen, that's what I want. I don't want it to refresh itself to go back to the PG welcome. We haven't really written a lot of real JavaScript code, so make sure it works here. We've written a lot of comments. Make sure you're regular make sure the JavaScript does work at this point. Does that work for everyone? Okay, so this FN signup needs to capture what was written in those boxes. It needs to check, did the person write the same password in both of those fields? If they filled in an email, if they typed in the password correct twice, great, that's enough that we need to save that into our database of users. Then we've got a new user. Then we can go deal with the login part. So in order for us to check what did they type into those boxes, in this function, we will create some variables to check what's in those boxes. We will create variables in this function because we only need to know what's in those boxes right now when we do sign up. So variables in a function only exist as the function is running. If I create these variables outside the function, they will be hanging around in memory always, as long as the app is running, slowing things down. So creating variables in a function means they are only uh, necessary and useful and in memory while the function is running. So we'll create some variables here via the JavaScript or job, the jQuery method. So with the dollar symbol, we'll call this L in email sign up equal to the dollar selector, the jQuery selector. We're going to go find something in the HTML and then store it in this jQuery object, jQuery based object. The something in quotes, pound sign, because it's got the ID. We don't need the document dot get element by ID anymore. We need to mention the pound sign here in email sign up. I need to do that also for the other two boxes. So comma, instead of a semicolon, because I'm still continuing to create variables, $l in password is equal to dollar selector quotes pound in password, what did I call it? Password sign up? In password sign up, in password sign up, comma, L in password confirm sign up equal to dollar selector quotes pound in password confirm sign up and that one's end of statement semicolon. To see this in action, we'll do some console output. $L in email sign up, comma, $L in password. 
Now, at the moment, as we're typing all of this, it would be nice that it fills it in for us. Notepad++ does have an autocomplete feature, but I have it turned off on these computers, so we're typing it longhand. Other code editors, uh, you start typing and it automatically types a lot for you. This has it too, but for the beginning I wanted us to do it the long way. Remind me in a moment and I'll show you how to turn it on, because, you know, I'm typing this and I'm going to mistype it. Once I turn, show you how to turn on autocomplete, as soon as you start typing a little bit of it, it'll know what you want, and then you just press tab and it'll finish it for you, so that you don't mistype it. But for the beginning, I want to type it longhand. Now, password, confirm, sign up. So here, um, again, you, you select something that you type, and the other instances of it should also select. Unfortunately, if they're uppercase or lowercase, they will still select. But just a moment ago, I, I selected this one, and it didn't highlight, because I saw that I missed the in part of it. So um, as, long as, there's, as long as they're spelled consistently, it'll, it'll work. To fully see this in action, you can save it and run it, check the console, type something, you'll see something in the console. Not quite exactly right, but you'll see something in the console now as you start to fill in those boxes. And you click, uh, you click join. Let's see, so I'm going to go back to home, refresh, sign up. Join. Check your spelling. L in email sign up line nineteen. I did it again. I didn't put the uppercase. Maybe I should stop putting that uppercase. Okay, so. I typed in some stuff, I click join, I get some output, I get various objects, a lot of stuff to look at, we'll simplify this in a moment, but I'm getting output. It's showing that you, you are displaying the first object, and the second object, and the third object. It did capture these. It captured too much. It captured the object completely. I only wanted the value of what was typed inside of the box. So we'll do this to refine it, that object dot val. Give me the value of what was typed in that object. And I have various other uh, methods that I can use on this jQuery object. I can check what was the value typed, what was the font used, what was the color, the size, the width, the, the text content. So. If we have a dot val, the methods, the method of dot val use the command to check the value typed into this object. Then when you test it, it should actually give you what you typed. I typed in an email, a <coughs> password, and a second password. So the value of what we typed into those boxes. So this created an object of like all of the properties of the HTML node. And here I'm checking the value property of that node. I could do a little shorthand 
up here where I selected the object and also then check the value so that I don't have to mention it over here. It's sort of either or. There's different purposes for doing it in different ways. So the exact same result. There's different purposes to do it different ways. If you do it this way, where you say, let's select that object and only then check the value, what's stored in here is only that value. But if we do it this way without specifying the value property and instead saying the whole object, we have more leeway to do other things with that object, like changing its size. Uh, or position, um, alignment, and all of that. So there's no right or way, wrong way to do it here unless it's you know it's doing what you want. I'm going to keep it this way, as in because I named it L element, the whole element. What I like to do if I if I'm dealing with only the value of something, I would have named it val in email signup. This variable, this object, only stores the value of, the, of what I'm selecting. So, just going to put it back like that. If you kind of know a little bit of what you're doing or if it makes sense, do it either way. If it makes sense to you, do it either way that you like. This is the way I'll do it here just because this is selecting it a little bit more completely. Created variables, referencing objects or elements in HTML. Or, now, or val in email sign up to dollar selector quotes pound in email sign up dot val method only selected only selected the value in the HTML element stored it Output only the value of the object in the console. So that's again this shorthand. Um, jQuery has the shorthand of dot val method to read or write actually the value of an HTML element. That input field. When we worked on JavaScript the other time, um, we didn't we use dot inner HTML equals that, uh, that that other time. That was another way to sort of do what we have here via the plain old JavaScript. Okay, so those lines, 18 to 20, um, capture what the person typed into those fields. Next, what I want to do, the big idea, is to check that both of those passwords match up. So either the passwords will match, and we can create the user, 
or else the passwords don't match and we have to tell the person, hey, your passwords don't match, try again. A little later, we'll also need to check, does that user exist? What if a person is trying to create an account of an email address that is already in the system? So we'll have to check a few different things. The way we can make these decisions is with our various conditional loops, conditional statements. JavaScript, like most programming languages, has a way to make a decision. And basically it's a decision based on true or false. Everything in most programming languages is true or false. Binary, 0 and 1, true or false, yes or no. So we're, we're going to use a, a, uh, a statement here to check if both passwords match, true, create the user, or else false, they don't match, so give an error. We have then an if else uh, block. If something is true, do something, or else it's false, do something else. This is one way to do it. We'll see there's many ways to do many of these things. They're all right, they're all wrong. If you understand how it works, it's right. If it doesn't do what you want, it's wrong. So any of these ways that you may know should work. But this is, to get started as a beginner, if else statement. <coughs> to check for a true or false condition. It's a conditional statement. We've got about a few other ones that we can check, that we can use. This will only check two possibilities, true or false. There is a way, in a slightly different syntax, to check for three things, or five things, or five possibilities, whatever. And there's other ways to check in other ways as well. <coughs> uh, switch statements, or while statements. There's other ways to do something for loops. This is one way to check for something being true or false. Notice I don't have a semicolon at the end of this curly brace. Um, we, didn't have a, we didn't have a curly brace at the end of the whole function as well. It's common to not terminate um, uh, curly brace statements with a semicolon. It would work fine if I had a semicolon there and also a semicolon there. Although some error checkers are picky and they, and they would say superfluous semicolon. I'll just leave it out. So what I'm checking here, um, what I want to check is the password value the same as the confirm password value. That's what's going to go in the parentheses. So we'll say dollar $l in password sign up dot val method. I'm going to check if it's not the same. If these passwords do not match up uh, exclamation point equals equals space. So very, very specific syntax here. I'll explain that in one moment. Let's checking it against L in password. Confirm. Sign up. So here we're saying, if the value of the first password does not equal to the value value of the second password. Sorry about that, the value. If the value of the first password does not equal to the value of the second password, give them a message that the passwords don't match, or else they do match. Create the account. I need to see this in action. Passwords don't match. 
console passwords match. So this should be enough to, to, to test it a, a bit, save it and run it, put an email address, put two passwords that don't match, and you should see the console log giving you the first message. If you try passwords that do match, it should give you the console log of the second block. This block, it's kind of backwards, because again I said true and false. This part is true, this part is false, but I'm thinking sort of backwards. I'm checking that yes, it's true, that no, they don't match. And we could write it in that yes, it's true, that yes, they match. Either or, but it's all about the true or the false. So here I'm saying yes, it's true, that no, they don't match, or else they did match. If we wrote the syntax a little bit different, then this first part would have been matching or truthiness, and this part would have been false. Uh, yes, they do match, or else no, they didn't match. This block executes if the above condition is true. Or else, this block executes if the above condition is false. So testing it, so I'll type ABC and I'll type ABCD, join, and I gotta double check my spelling, confirm instead of confirm, okay, line 26, confirm. To remind myself to turn on autocomplete. Anyway, so ABC, ABCD, join, um, <coughs> passwords don't match. Up here I saw that I typed the email, I typed ABC and ABCD, passwords don't match. If I type only ABC on both, click join, I saw I type ABC, ABC, passwords match. So this if-else statement is working. It is checking what is the value. It is checking that they do not match. This is the syntax. That exclamation point is not. And then double equals is checking for equality. Check this value. Check that it's not equal to the second confirmation value. If they don't match, get the message. They don't match or else they do match. So it jumps to else and it says they match. Passwords match. A little later we'll make a pop-up that says passwords don't match. At the least we're seeing in the developers console output for ourselves as we as we set this up they don't match. What would be useful to the user is well, they mistyped the password, they can't see how they mistyped it. To help them, we're going to empty out these two fields, not the email, but we're going to empty out both of those input fields so that they can try again. And a little later, next time, we'll make a pop-up 
that says passwords don't match. So for the moment we can clean out these fields in the if block. Eventually we will have a user message to say passwords don't match. But at least what we're going to do is to those input fields we will empty them. The two out of the three. So we reference the first field. L in email sign up dot val semicolon. We mention the second field. L in not email, sorry, password. L in password confirm sign up dot val. And not only can val be used to retrieve a value that's in the field, val can be used to set a value. In quotes, nothing will set those fields to nothing. It will clear those fields out. I don't want to clear the whole form. I don't want them to retype their email address. That's too much, too much annoyance. I will let them know, you mistyped your password, try again. But since those passwords are invisible, they don't know what they misspelled. So clean the fields out to try again. Dot val jQuery method can be used to read a value and set a value. So yeah, I can type other things in here like correct password. They won't see it because it's a password field, it's invisible. But val can be used to set a value. And if you put nothing in those quotes, it'll put nothing in the field. Don't put a space, because a space is not nothing, a space is just invisible. A space does take up space. ASCII character 32, so nothing is between those quotes. No space. What's ha supposed to happen there is I'm going to type A, B, C, D, and I'll type A, B, C, click join, fields clear out. Eventually the message will appear to the user telling them try again, fill those in again, please. That's the first part of this if block. As we wind down the main lecture, what we will do next time is, well, okay, uh, we we're capturing valid input, we need to uh, actually create an account and save it. When we come back next time, we're going to use num something known as local storage, which is a very, very basic, simple database, more like a super cookie that can save data into the project permanently. All of these variables are temporary as long as the app is running. If you want to research your yourself for next time, you want to look up what is local storage. To do local storage. We'll do it together next time, but there's something called local storage. This is a way to save permanent data. It'll get saved in the web browser, or it'll get saved in the app when we take it to the app eventually. This is going to be a simple kind of way to do a login, log out. Later on we'll use a, full, a more full-fledged database, but for the moment we just need to save some simple info, email and password. We then need to check if that account exists, check if the password is the same, let them log in, blah, 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 and we can do that with local storage. So that's your unofficial homework over the weekend. Go look up local storage, see what it's about, and we'll do it together next time. So far what we did today was a lot. We created a bunch of these screens, a bunch of these interfaces, this is all working pretty nice. The back-end stuff of the coding is coming along. We're still a long way from it, but we have plenty of time to get it all working right, and we will see that it's going to be a lot of JavaScript for this to work, a lot of actual code that does something. The HTML and the CSS just kind of sit there after you set it up. But so far, because of a lot of comments, we've got 50 lines of code. If we just combine it down to the real code, take out all the comments, we still probably only have like 12 lines. We've still got a lot to do, 
and literally this will be up to like you know 700 lines of code eventually when it's all done probably more but we're on our way general questions on what we talked about today yes so this is a lot so my question is since we're all beginning with the book I'll show you like what needs to be input to make sure everything works or is that like a check off list or something like that no, the any book, um, there, I don't think you're going to find any book that teaches you exactly what I'm talking about here because we have a specific goal. We have a goal of a login, log out. But the book that I recommended and every other book is going to give you the pieces of what does it mean when you use the jQuery selector? How do you create objects? What is an if-else statement? So I've synthesized the various chapters of the book into something meaningful. So I would recommend go into the book uh, and check uh, you know, it's probably like chapter four where it starts to talk about what is jQuery exactly. Check the book about what is an if else statement. I don't have the pages memorized. But just check the index and jump into what we've talked about if else statements, jQuery variables, and you'll get another perspective on what we talked about. Any other general questions? All right, so we'll have some lab time until 9.30 if you need it. I'll put my code in the folder. Uh, call me over if you need help, and I'll upload these videos if you want to redo the replay.